Hello everyone, my name's Meg um, and I'm currently studying a Master's in Conservation and Ecosystem Management at Newcastle University. Um, I was kindly asked by the NHSN to talk about my experience working as a meadow maker for plant life uh, last summer. So between April and September 2021, myself and five other young conservationists were tasked with creating wildflower meadows across the country. Um, so the project was run by the charity Plant Life, uh, and which is the only charity in the UK dedicated to conserving plants, fungi and wildflowers. Uh, the project itself was funded by uh, the Green Recovery Challenge Fund, delivered by the National Lottery Heritage Fund in partnership with Natural England and the Environment Agency. And the purpose behind this fund was to support green projects and put a bit of more money back into conservation after COVID. Now Plant Life took on six young meadow makers uh, with the aim of helping young conservationists get that all important foot in the door and to kickstart um, our careers in conservation. Uh, so four meadow makers were based in different locations uh, within England. Uh, one was in Cumbria, one in Herefordshire, East Sussex and Lancashire. And two were based in the southwest, and that was myself and my colleague Alex, as you can see here in the picture. So um, we were mainly working within Devon, and our mission uh, was to arrange the restoration of 19 sites, um, which ranged from community spaces to just old pasture fields. Um, the owners taking on the restoration also varied in ecological experience, with many of them never having taken on a restoration like this before. And although um, Alex and I were very keen botanists, uh, we also didn't have any prior experience of wildflower uh, meadow creation. So we were a little daunted at first, to say the least. Um, however, we had a huge amount of help from More Meadows, uh, which was the local community-based initiative um, that aims to actually provide a network of advice and education uh, for those interested in conserving species-rich grasslands within Devon. So with their help, um, we made a great summer and were able to successfully restore these sites. And for the rest of the presentation, I just wanted to talk um, you through how to actually go about restoring a wildflower meadow and just to give you an insight into my experience of a meadow maker. So, first of all, just to address the question, why are meadows um, important and why are they worth restoring in the first place? So currently in the UK, uh, wildflower meadows have experienced a 97% decline um, since the 1930s. And this is due to a range of reasons uh, such as land use change and agricultural intensification. But meadows themselves are a really great source of pollen and nectar and uh, the diverse assemblage of grasses and flowers make it an excellent habitat for a range of invertebrates. Um, for instance, this oil beetle on the right hand side here down at the bottom, um, they carry out their whole life cycle within meadows and is so therefore is reliant on these habitats for survival. But due to recent losses um, over the last few years, um, there's been a dramatic reduction in their distribution across the UK. Um, and meadows are also important for carbon storage as the diversity of plants uh, helps to lock in carbon within the soil. And obviously, meadows are really have a really positive effect on mental health. And I'm sure if any of you have seen um, a wildflower meadow bloom in the summer, it is tr truly a joy to behold. And also recent research has found that looking at flowers uh, really helps to reduce the stress hormones in the body. Um, and we've also just got to remember that wildflower meadows are in fact a man-made habitat. And they came about because farmers relied on uh, leaving a field to grow um, to provide a source of hay for livestock over winter. And they are still managed in this way today. So um, they, are, they have a hay cut taken at the end of summer after the flowers have bloomed. So uh, our initial steps, uh, we very much hit the ground running when the project uh, commenced in April. Our first days on the job were filled with meeting with landowners and assessing the sites uh, that we were to restore. 
Um, the most important thing you can do before going ahead with a meadow restoration is to actually look at the soil phosphate index. Um, now the phosphate level is a really good indicator of soil nutrients and ideally there needs to be as few nutrients in the soil as possible as this is the conditions that wildflowers prefer to grow in. Um, if, a foil, the, if the phosphate index is high, wildflowers are often outcompeted by vigorous grasses or nettles that obviously limit the amount of meadow restoration that can occur. Along with soil analysis, it's also really good to know what the pH of the meadows are, so um, this will kind of indicate what species are likely to grow there. And this was already um, checked for us before the project began, so everyone got a tick for this. Uh, whilst out and about with the landowners, uh, we were also uh, trying to identify some problem species. So here we are here. So what we would class as a problem species would be uh, nettles, creeping thistles, docks and also hogweed. Um, and these species can spread really rapidly when disturbed. And a crucial part of the meadow making process is to disturb the land quite substantially. So if this were to occur with the species there, then it would actually promote their growth across the whole site, which is obviously not what we want. But luckily, most of our sites were pretty much free of these species um, and anything that was there, we would just advise them to pull by hand. And by doing this, you can actually reduce their numbers um, over time. And after we met with all the landowners, Alex and I then focused on creating some restoration plans, um, and which is essentially just a document to outline um, the different uh, elements that were to come across the coming months. So by far the biggest challenge we had was uh, finding enough wildflower seed to sufficiently uh, cover all the sites. Um, the goal was to find uh, seed that as locally sourced as possible to ensure that the seeds were adapted to local climate conditions and also to support the local economy. Uh, this aspect was also quite important for us because we wanted to provide a financial incentive to encourage people to actually manage land as species rich grassland in the first place. Um, in terms of sourcing and collecting seed, we definitely needed help in this area. And so we reached out to experienced members of the Devon Wildlife Trust, who were an absolute huge help in uh, suggesting sites that we could harvest from, and also just educating us about the general seed collecting process. Although we were very daunted uh, when they first informed us that you usually had all their seed harvesting sites set up a year in advance, uh, whereas we were only two months away from when we needed to start collecting any seed. So obviously we needed to act very quickly uh, to ensure that we could actually harvest enough seed for the project. Um, now they were also really helpful in kind of warning us about the risks of uh, seed harvesting. And one of those risks being the fact that obviously landowners and farmers still need a source of income from the hay produced um, by the meadow after at the end of summer. Uh, but the downside of this is that farmers will obviously make hay when the sun shines. Um, and so there's a limited window um, to cut the field uh, during the best weather um, that they could. And this might mean that actually they cut it too early for some of the later blooming species um, to have gone to seed. And so we lose out on harvesting these species. So what we did in order to counter this was um, we managed to secure a range of sites with a range of different species. So hopefully we collected a whole host of the target species we were after. And those target species um, were traditional meadow species found um, down in the southwest. Uh, such as what we have, have here is some meadow buttercups, uh, common knapweed, red clovers, bird, bird's foot trefoil and some knapweeds as well. And we're also looking for some nice meadow grasses such as um, sweet vernal, crested dog's tail and fescues. But of course we can't forget about the king of uh, meadow restoration which is yellow rattle. Um, and yellow rattle is honestly an essential meadow maker. It is hemiparasitic, which means it can take nutrients from nearby plants. And that includes undesirable grasses such as coxfoot, which um, is very vigorous, um, vigorous growing and can shade out lots of, lots of wildflowers. 
Um, but when successful, yellow rattle really dominates and spreads uh, quickly throughout the meadow. And essentially this paves the way for the wildflowers to grow. So sometimes you do see a huge boom in yellow rattle establishment, but then their numbers will decline over time as the meadow grows and the wildflowers uh, take over. So harvesting as much yellow rattle as possible was essential uh, for these first nine meadows. And on to harvesting. So we split the flowers that uh, we wanted to harvest into early flowering species and then late flowering species um, and conducted harvesting in these two stages. So we harvested using a variety of techniques, the first being hand harvesting. Uh, yellow rattle was the earliest bloomer on our list um, and it typically flowers in June um, but because of it was quite a cool start to last year everything was set back a bit and um, harvesting actually started in July time. And as you can see from the picture here, uh, yellow rattle is uh, really quite easy to spot when it's ripe because it goes um, uh, very brown and dry. And when you actually shake the seed heads, obviously you get that characteristic rattle sound. Um, and if you shake the seeds hard enough, um, they, the seeds actually fall out. And this was how we harvested um, yellow rattle at one site. So we actually just went around with a cardboard box, shook the seed heads, and we collected um, a lot of seed uh, quite, quite effectively. Uh, so the reason we actually hand harvested at this particular site, um, which was absolutely inundated with yellow rattle, was because it had only been restored about two years ago and this was its best year yet for rattle. So to not jeopardise the progression of the meadow, um, we only took a small fraction of the seed available. And then the second hand harvesting technique we adopted uh, was a leaf blower with a sucking function. It was a little less back breaking than having to bend down um, to hand harvest. Um, and we used it often on sites that had difficult terrain or were not easy to access with the larger harvesting equipment. And although it was relatively efficient, it was still quite time consuming. Um, and the jury is still out with this technique really. Because ultimately the uh, most efficient and fastest way of harvesting was using the brush harvester, uh, which is this contraption here on the left. Um, the harvester is pulled along by a quad bike and it's basically just pulled over a field that has already gone to seed. There is a brush um, in the harvester which basically just flicks all the seed into a collecting drum which can then be tipped out and you can then process the seed after that. Um, this harvester was um, driven by Simon from Devon Wildlife Trust and we also had help from Dartmoor National Park. So we had two harvesters um, available to us over the summer, which was fantastic. So once you've collected the seed, um, uh, as you can see in the second picture, you can tip the seed out of the drum and um, pl place it on a large mesh grid, which basically acts as a sieve. Um, with a person on either side, you shake the uh, sieve from side to side, uh, enable the seed to actually drop down onto a tarpaulin, whilst the larger bits of vegetation are caught and then can be discarded later. So we sieve the material at least twice in order to get as pure seed as possible. Um, and obviously this was the most efficient way of collecting the quantities of seed that we needed for the project. And the last stage of seed harvesting um, was obviously to dry the seed out. And this was done um, in a cool, dry location. Here it was a barn from one of our local landowners. Um, and you basically just spread out the seed as thinly as possible in order to make sure um, all the seed is dried evenly. And um, overall, we actually managed to harvest 130 kilogram of local meadow seed, which was absolutely fantastic, uh, considering how daunted we were to begin with. Uh, we really surpassed our expectations and how much seed we could even collect. Um, and then during this time, we were actually encouraging landowners to start thinking about preparing their fields for seed transferal. Um, preparing the ground uh, so that it's open to seeds is really important um, because if not enough bare ground is created, it could set back the establishment of the wildflowers um, or actually the grass that was there previously could just start taking over and start uh, growing again. So not giving the wildflowers a chance to begin with. So firstly, uh, the field needs to be cut as short as possible. 
And then it needs to be scarified, which is essentially scraping away the first few centimetres of the ground um, in order to show bare earth. This was done uh, using either a tine harrow, as you can see in this picture here, or um, power harrows were also used. And we actually found that these were a lot more powerful and effective at producing uh, the level of bare ground required. Ideally, scarification takes place within a few days of then broadcasting the seed. Um, so there's limited time for the grass to regrow or for the ground to harden up. And overall, you want about 75% of bare ground, which is quite stark when you first, first see it happening. But as you can see in this picture here, um, this is one of our landowners' um, sites that was uh, really well scarified using a power harrow. And, um, then the seed is broadcasted and uh, this was typically, good, typically done by the landowners themselves um, but with some of them they, they actually made more of an event of it, invited their friends around and um, enticed them in with some cider and cake uh, for an afternoon of seed uh, broadcasting and you can see with sites like that it was probably uh, a great opportunity for them to take part in and to also inspire others to, to um, uh, create wildflower patches in their own gardens as well. And we actually did use a different technique for seed transferal as well uh, called green hay and this is so called because um, instead of harvesting the pure seed all the material from a donor site is cut and spread onto the recipient site when it's still green. Uh, so no extensive dry, drying of the material needs to take place. But it was a bit more log uh, logistically tricky. So only three of the sites that we had actually received this way as a uh, transfer of seed. Um, and first of all, what you want to make sure is to um, identify a species rich meadow, which is relatively close to the recipient site. So this particular site here, I don't know if you can make out, but there's a lot of butterfly orchids. So it was a really fantastic uh, donor site to have had. Um, and yes, like I said, you want the donor site to be as close as possible to the recipient site uh, because the whole process of um, green hay needs to take place within one day. So within one day, you need to cut the uh, field, bale it up, transfer it uh, to the recipient site and spread it. Um, and if transport time takes um, quite long, then you're actually risking um, risking the viability of the seeds um, because they could actually start to warm up within those bales and start to rot. So yeah, just as quickly as possible is the best way to, um, to do this technique. And once the green bales arrive at the site, um, they are then spread as so. Um, and overall, we found that this method is also very successful. Um, and previously, when other people have done it in the past, it's just as successful as using pure seed. But just, just like I said, um, it takes a bit more work to, to sort out the logistics. So in summary, what did we achieve in the whirlwind six months of meadow making? Well, in the southwest, um, we actually managed to restore 100 acres of wildflower meadow and across the project um, as a whole, a thousand acres of meadow uh, were restored, which is a phenomenal feat for the charity um, and we've really have created a difference in bringing these important habitats uh, back to the British countryside. Um, Alex and I were also key at establishing connections with external charities and organisations such as Dartmoor National Park and Devon Wildlife Trust for Plant Life. And I just want to reiterate that we managed to uh, collect 130 kilograms of um, wildflower seed. Um, and this actually is equivalent to £30,000 if you'd bought it commercially. Um, and um, we actually harvested enough for 15 kilograms per hectare for um, each of our landowners, um, whereas we thought at the beginning about four to five kilograms would be enough. But yeah, we managed to actually have 15 kilograms, which was fantastic. And on a more personal note, um, even though the project was only six months, I have learned so many valuable experiences and skills from it. And it highlights just how important these jobs are for young conservationists. 
So even though I went straight into a master's afterwards, uh, the other meadow makers were able to find jobs within the sector almost straight away. And Alex, for instance, is now working for Somerset Wildlife Trust as a farm cluster facilitator, using many of the um, skills and experiences she gained from um, the meadow maker um, experience in her current job. So that, that's fantastic. Um, and a really important skill to have as well uh, is project management, which I suppose I hadn't really had much experience of before. Um, Alex and I were very much in control of the project from start to finish, uh, which was invaluable and um, is an essential skill for when I'm looking for jobs in the future. Um, also, the aspect of collaboration and liaising with external charities and farmers, um, as well as landowners, is a really important skill to have in conservation. So what's next for me? Um, so I'm currently about a third of the way through my master's um, and for my dissertation project I very much stuck with grasslands. Um, so the project is in collaboration with Natural England and I'll be looking into the species rich habitat, um, purple moor grass and rush pasture in uh, Northumberland. This habitat is um, often found within farmland um, and doesn't really settle into one vegetation classification. So the importance and conservation of the habitat is often overlooked as a result. So what I'll be doing is working to cre create a quality index uh, so it can be used in the future to rapidly assess this habitat for positive indicator species, just to gain an understanding of the quality, much as you would do with a species rich wildflower meadow. And the hope is that in the future, this habitat is considered important enough um, for it to be conserved and restored. Um, however, there has been limited research um, or recording of these sites in Northumberland. So my summer will mostly be made up of uh, looking in quadrats and crawling on the floor, um, as you can see in these pictures here. And actually, if this is something that interests you as well, I will most likely need some knowledgeable uh, volunteers to help survey some of these sites, uh, just to get as much data as possible uh, to make my, more, my analysis a bit more robust. So if you're interested in potentially taking part, uh, you can drop me an email on the email address seen in the screen, um, or actually keep an eye out on my social media, where I'll most likely be making some announcements about volunteer days closer to the time. So thank you ever so much for listening to my talk and thank you again to the NHSN for inviting me to talk to you all today.